On this episode of the Leanne Wood podcast, we look at the question of political polarisation. I'm sure we all know of people who have fallen out or severed contact with former friends or relatives because of quarrels over politics. And it takes only a few seconds of scrolling on social media before you encounter arguments, denouncing and people being vicious to one another. Once you start spotting the signs, culture wars are everywhere. But perhaps some aspects of our politics has to be polarised. On some questions, don't we have to take a hard line? On racism, misogyny, homo and transphobia, doesn't there have to be a no-tolerance attitude towards statements which cause harm to others? I want to explore some of these issues with Ali Goldsworthy. Ali is a former Liberal Democrat political activist, former vice chair of the party, who left politics after whistleblowing on sexual harassment within her party and not being taken seriously. She's recently co-authored a book called Poles Apart, which examines polarization in politics, the problems it causes, and what we can do about it. She's also working on practical ways of overcoming political polarization through the Depolarization Project, which she's going to tell us all about. Ali joins me from the United States, where she now works and lives. Ali, it's lovely to speak to you. Croeso Maur to the Leanne Wood podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Can I first of all ask you, why are you concerned about political polarisation? Can you explain what it is and why you initially became concerned about it? Yeah, it's a great question. So I suppose that the easiest part to think of there is political polarisation. And what is it? Because a lot of people think when they're, they think about this, you know, something like abortion, where someone can be very much on a pro-life or a, a pro-choice end of the, the spectrum. Um, and, you know, or are they pro-free trade or anti-free trade and, and things like that? That's not the type of polarisation that I am generally talking about because that's you know those issue polarization that's something about or you think it's about what's going on in your head what I'm talking about is polarization that's about an identity where you see someone from a different political grouping and instinctively dislike them or think they are less good than your own grouping so you are biased to people who think like you or wear the same political label as you and against those who aren't and I get really concerned about some of that's healthy and natural and normal and should be encouraged in a democracy but when I I get really concerned about it is when I see somebody looking at people from a different tribe and thinking well they must all be bad and bad in a way that's not about politics for example when you you saw Remainers say well anybody who voted leave they must be racist you know and that would that inherent in that is that anybody who was a Remainer can't be racist. And that's just not true in both directions. You know, that's really, that's that's not helpful. Or, you know, I, I came out to the States to go to Stanford fairly soon after Brexit and when Trump was elected and to see everybody presume that anybody who voted for Trump would be stupid, that there could be no legitimate reason for people to be concerned about, about Hillary Clinton. And I had an excellent conversation with uh, someone in Southern Indiana, actually, who was like, I really want my daughter to have a woman role model. But, you know, Hillary Clinton behaved terribly over Monica Lewinsky. And that's not the kind of person I want to put in the White House. And actually, you know, as someone who is sympathetic to the Democrats, undoubtedly that's closer to where my own politics lie, you know, that was quite a good argument. That didn't inherently make them stupid or racist or, or anything like that. And those spillover effects, which occur in all forms of life once we become really polarised, is, is where I become concerned you know it shouldn't affect the health advice that a doctor gives you the chance of being convicted of a crime the investment decisions whether a bridge gets built or not you know whether people get loans money all of these things and you see it across all, all walks of life and I guess you you asked a bit like why why was I interested and what really did that is you know I, I was clearly I was active in politics for a long time and, and when I spoke out you know in with a a case that everybody thought was credible lots of people still didn't believe me and I, I wondered why that was and and it was noticeable that people from my own tribe in particular did not believe me because it was uncomfortable for them and from the other side you know that that it worked in the opposite direction that was that was definitely part of it and also professionally I I you know I was a movement builder I used to get millions of people to take action every year for which the consumers association and I never wondered whether the movement that I built which was often against something to be honest because it's easier to do it that way, whether 
I contributed to polarization because I never put a single thought into whether I needed to heal those divides. And I suppose the conflicts of all of those things, then looking at the very palpable divisions after Brexit and, and things like that were, were pretty much why I became obsessed with polarization and try and how to try and help bridge those divides really. Do you think it's something that is a more recent phenomenon? It seems to me that it's something that's grown more in recent times, the conflict, the public conflict in politics I mean. Now social media has clearly got a role to play, it's difficult to develop nuanced arguments on Facebook or on Twitter but there's more to it than that isn't there? I don't remember this level of antagonism in politics when I started as an activist. Maybe I'm being naive and I'm I'm remembering it through rose-tinted spectacles. Do you think something has changed in the last decade or so? Has this antagonism increased more recently or is it has it always been there? Gosh, there's a, there's a few things at play there, which is often, this isn't always the case, but if we have unpleasant experiences in something that we're going to try and carry on doing, we often are sort of programmed by our brains to try and forget them if it's uncomfortable for us. So like there's one thing that, you know, and, and we've probably all had that where we've gone somewhere and we're like, oh my God, that's terrible. I'd never do that again. And you get three years down the line, you're like, oh, it wasn't so bad. Now I have a bit of time to think about it. You know, maybe I'll go back on holiday there. Maybe I'll go back to a restaurant again. And, the, you know, politics is not immune from the same dynamics it doesn't always play that that way but you know that that's sort of rose tinted spectacles thing there's some truth in it it's polarization ebbs and flows and the polarization i talk about is in political science they call it effective polarization uh, between different groups rather than issue polarization and we are not at the most polarized time in our history there is some comfort in that you know and if you think about times of big conflict around the 80s and the minor strikes and you know particularly in in south wales and other places there was a lot of conflict then or the three-day week clearly if you go back a bit a bit further you know you start to hit the ones that are most memorable you know things like Nazi Germany or where there's been war and lots of conflict you know this is not an unheard of this ebb and flow is reasonably normal but there does come a point once you started tipping that it and you keep going you know civil wars don't become inevitable but it becomes harder to pull back and this effective polarization is as you can measure it has in general been growing in the UK a dislike of your political other has been growing over the last 10 years Social media, of course, plays a role in that. And it can be really tempting to blame it for all of it. In in general, the effect of these things is that they mute moderates, so people that would help bridge divides, and they amplify the voices of extremes for algorithmic reasons, but also how we own work, work in our own brains and what we remember and what we respond to uh, and go from there. So that's that undoubtedly plays a role. But if the question I often say to people is if we took social media away, would we still have a polarization problem? And the answer is yes. And part of the, the problem, what they normally say is with polarization, people like to look for simple answers or a convenient baddie. And Facebook in particular doesn't half make itself a convenient baddie or meta in the broader sense as it is now. But if if we look for that and think it's a really simple solution, that, that's probably not going to work with polarization. It's, it's a lot more complex. My not very cheery and note to your question is things are likely to get worse before they get better. Things that contribute towards polarisation are include, or some of the big contributors are rising levels of uncertainty and economic inequality and, you know, I mean, yes, social media as well. But if the pandemic has done one thing, it's made life much more uncertain for a lot of people. And secondly, you know, and this would be the same, whoever was in charge, pretty much, the amount of public sector borrowing that has gone on and people are going to have to work out how to pay back and what they're going to do means that taxes are probably going to rise for people. Depends how and where and what's going on. And, you know, the I'm not sure what the benefits, you know, to me, they probably should be cut much further in the UK. Um, but like if they are, that sense of inequality between rich and poor is, is, is going to grow. And for that reason, I think probably for the next few years, things are going to get worse before they get better. And Scotland, you will know much more than me about this, is also a different kettle of fish in itself. Uh, yes, that's a cheerful thought. But there are, you know, you mentioned Scotland, there are perhaps some opportunities to see some glints of hope and light. Yeah. I'm wondering if there are some issues that we need to polarise, though. We have to take a zero tolerance approach to racism in our political debate, for example. And of course, those are the forms of discriminatory language and behaviour which cause harm to people. Yeah. Is there such a thing as good polarisation? 
Uh, yeah, there definitely can be some some stuff which is good polarization. Obviously, I particularly like people who can be polarizing on issues that I agree with them on because I think they're right and they're just taking a strong and noble stance uh, as opposed to the other way. But uh, we talked about this briefly before we came on air. I'm I'm very grateful as a woman that some of the suffragettes took a very polarizing position to help me get the vote. Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, and you know, it, I suppose there's a few things behind that is normally if you're you know you know you need what's called a spectrum of allies approach used by a guy called George Lakoff if people want to go and look up the academic stuff behind it but you know you you don't just want to take people who completely agree with you further on the cause if you want to bring about change there's normally some people a bit in the middle somewhere and it might not be you that talks to them but it might be others I use this in a in a modern sense like I think Greenpeace can be tremendously effective campaigners I'm really pushing and often actually behind the scenes they're less inflammatory and I mean that almost in a complimentary way to them about how they engage but Greenpeace are effective because WWF and RSPB are often there to all the national trusts are there to to bring along other people who might not always agree with some of their more protest and polarizing driven things but by being polarized they also put things on the agenda you know you look at what the arctic 30 did for example with some very polarizing campaign techniques uh, and go from there and i think that there can be a a real role for it when i talk about and it's also extremely legitimate and um particularly legitimate for those who don't have access to the same levers of power that i do you know or are you know to use the parlance of them structurally excluded from it so you know i'm a reasonably affluent white british woman with a with it, as I discover out here, an accent that makes people think that I'm clever, and sometimes I am. But if I, if I, um, you know, like if that wasn't the case, say I was black and less well educated, then some of the the routes to influence that I have might be less open to me. And at that point, you know, being polarizing becomes one of the only ones that's there. And I think we need to be not just understanding of that, but you know, look to actually how you can distribute power more evenly, and particularly power through the political process, is an important part of this. And I suppose when people get polarized the temptation as is happening at the UK now is you know Boris Johnson is able to get away with some anti-democratic behavior and processes and trying to tolerate sleaze that he would never be able to get away with in a less polarized society right that's that's one of the consequences of it and then that's when polarization can beget other polarization so I'm here bringing you lots and lots of cheer hopefully at some point you'll ask me about ways to bridge divides because I do actually have a few a few solutions <laughs> it's a big area to work on I will definitely come come on to that shortly there's plenty of evidence to show the good that can come about from bringing people together to talk to breaking down the barriers that stand between people and open communication in in general this doesn't always account for the power balances that exist between people. You touched on it in, in your last answer. But for example, getting the police to talk with young people of colour on, say, a council estate is all very well and may increase understanding between two groups of, of polarised people. But the power is still all on one side. So isn't power inevitably polarising? I think power can often be polarizing you know but I'm not sure that I would agree it is necessarily inevitably polarizing and you give a really good example actually of uh, you know and, and you know it's a bit basic philosophy but some people always need power over anybody else to be able to enforce rules in society so there's a there's a wonderful woman out here called Rachel Kleinfeld who works for the booking institute um, and her thesis and she studied many countries around the world is that a functioning police and regulatory regime around politics is or and more generally actually is critical for depolarization because then people trust that the rules will be enforced that there is somewhere that they can go and talk to and obviously often particularly for people who are not white that isn't the case and that's you know the, the UK has its its own significant problems with the police force, but they are not the same that manifest out here in the, in the US, you know. Um, and South Wales police in particular has a pretty appalling history on how it's dealt with some issues of, of racism that rightfully continue to be exposed. So, uh, yeah, there is some bits around, around power and how it can be inherently polarising. But what I wanted to, to pick up was, you know, people often think that you put people in a room and you mediate conversations between them and that's how you try and solve things and 
like that often just doesn't work so for a few I mean you know you were a social worker for god you probably don't need me to tell you this but like a few of the things that that can go on is that actually when people get challenged they can end up holding on to their initial views more firmly than they did beforehand that's actually extremely common and that's because if it's become a part of your identity then who you are as a person starts to feel threatened when you're challenged and people often think well it's just the other that have it as part of their identity and you know I often say well if you say I believe in remain you know from the referendum then that was how you thought about something if you say I am a remainer then that's part of your identity, right? And that's you. And then when that starts being threatened, it can be really hard to hear other points of view on why people might be doing things. And that's that's when polarization can really can really kick in. And actually, more often than not, things backfire. People will often use deliberative democracies as examples or the exercises around deliberative democracy as an example of, of how to try and reduce polarization. And it can definitely have its role, but people need to enter that room open to the idea that they might be wrong and that someone else has had a different experience to them that could be incredibly valid you know people again will often point to Ireland and the referendums on um, homosexuality and on abortion out there which were were both won and part of the reason that they were won was you know well at the same time there was nine deliberative democracy exercises and the other seven were not won you know so it doesn't always work when people look at it um but the the public in Ireland were a long way ahead of where the politicians were like actually that was as much a political exercise as it was one in in bringing people together and, and healing divides so I think there's a a lot in how people, you know, contact theory and how people are introduced to each other, which can or cannot work. And, you know, what you say, people do need to be willing to give up power and more than anything, accept that they might have been wrong, you know, and powerful people find it really hard to accept they might have been wrong and to change their mind. There's very little reward for it. And rich, powerful people find that particularly hard because rich people don't like to think that they're very rich. They often think that they have, that, you know, they're more normal than they are. Clearly, more people fighting each other isn't the way to find political solutions to problems that maximum numbers of people can live with. And with democracy facing huge challenges in terms of its credibility and legitimacy at the moment, what can be done to get to a point that surely we all want, where politics is about using our power to provide collective solutions to the problems we face as communities and as a society? So, well, I'm just, I suppose that's a huge question. <laughs> so, as you're listening to me, I was told by the, the way I, I just did it. So uh, I think because this is a really, you know, I often describe it as a Gordian knot of an issue. Like there is no panacea and no straightforward solution to, to polarization, but there are a few things that people can do. So we're a function both of our behavior and, and the environment in which we operate. And, you know, because you're a politician, let's dwell on some of the way that, that politics operates for a second. And then I'll give a couple of, of more unusual examples that have, have helped bridge divides in politics. So, uh, you know, one is um, actually around, let's say, the role of select committees um, or committees in the, you know, in the in the Senate and how that how independent they are and how much you can be rewarded for doing well there and doing good scrutiny. And often the answer is you don't get rewarded very much for that. You can get promoted, particularly if you're in the governing party, for being a toady and for being a lackey with what's going on. And that is, you know, because it's got higher numbers, that's especially an issue in Westminster, you know, with what goes on. So there's a guy called Alan Mack who... Uh, is a Conservative MP in, in Haven who basically, you know, will get up in PMQs and say, oh, can the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister is wonderful, can he remind me again how wonderful he is? You know, those kind of questions that Isabel Hardman maintains a hall of shame for. And, you know, eventually he ends up being promoted again and again, rather than somebody who, who might ask a slightly awkward question, which actually improves the policy and changes things for people on the ground. And, and I think that that's part of it and how select committees function at at Westminster, at least, it's, it's slightly changed so that, you know, it's elected on a cross-party basis, so that, I, I, I'll try and find some good examples of Conservatives at the minute, because I realise I'm pulling out bad ones again and again right now. They had a select committee uh, chairmanship there, and a guy called Chris Grayling, who uh, people may remember from David Cameron's memo memoirs, he included the line, I worked with Theresa Villiers, who was brilliant, and also Chris Grayling as a cabinet minister, and the absence of what he said about Chris Grayling said, you know, a lot about Chris's talent. Nonetheless, he was very loyal, and the Tories wanted to put him 
charge of one of the security committees. He didn't have any experience really in defence and security. And all of their people on the committee voted for him. And Julian Lewis, who did have like 15, 20 years experience doing security stuff, but was not as loyal to the leadership, he managed to persuade everybody else to vote for him. And therefore was able to provide better scrutiny of his own side. And that that process, the, how that process functioned, is really important for, for scrutiny. And this I should say there's a lot of evidence for this beyond politics and in the boardroom. Like if you have politically diverse boards where people are from different groups, they scrutinise things better and there is less likely to be bad behaviour and all sorts of things that, that go on. So that's definitely part of it. And then I'll just pick two examples from, from different worlds that, that, you know, that will be a bit more uplifting for people, um, I hope. So one is from uh, post-conflict Iraq, actually, where um, someone I know, Salma, who is now at Yale, she did an experiment with two football teams. She got Christians and Muslims who are clearly been literally at war with each other um, not that long ago and she she tried to bring them together to do some mixed teams and some which were just Christians and some that were just Muslims and tried to track their feelings towards each other but also their behavior for example would they be more likely to spend a voucher in a, a restaurant that was clearly identified as Christian or Muslim from their own group or their out group and what she found was that the effects for people who were playing football were quite significant actually they dropped in terms of their hostility towards each other where they were doing something that wasn't politics they had a common goal and something that was shared where they could prime that identity first and think of each other in other ways that was quite effective she did track things for like the spectators it was nothing like as pronounced and you know the effects off the field were not super significant which shows one that both this can be effective and second how hard it can be there's also things that governments can do that they don't so one of the, the most interesting studies i've seen in this area is let's go back to middle east so to israel and palestine unbelievably or maybe not to you leanne because i know you have a lot of knowledge in this part of the world the palestine has a stock market and I know someone who gave uh, who gave Israelis money to invest in the Palestinian stock market and then tracked who they were likely to vote for. And um, they became increasingly likely to vote for peace seeking parties if they had any. And I mean, a small like 50 quid stake in the Palestinian stock market. So actually, say, for example, you were the SNP and independence did happen and you wanted to say no look like our relationship with the rest of the UK still really matters to us say they gave everybody in Scotland 50 quid or whatever currency they had probably still quid to invest in the FTSE 100 or say the government had done the same thing when uh, when Brexit kicked off and said no we have an ongoing commitment and we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're encouraging everybody to put their money where their mouth is you know actually that would have helped try and and drop things there's other issues around that like actually can have very positive effects on financial literacy the quaker in me is is less certain about encouraging people to gamble on the stock market but you know like there is there's things around that there are some public policy solutions that are quite innovative that people don't even look at at the minute that could be could be really useful so there's two examples of where um divides have been bridged and it can be can be really effective there's a fair bit to think about there. There is a lot of polarisation. I'm discouraged by the fact that you've said that it's likely to get worse before it gets better. But you have given us some sources of hope for for some, some ways of getting around this. Is there anything you want to add before we finish, Ali? This has been a really interesting conversation. No, well, I suppose, well, I suppose I've got one question for you, Leanne, as well, which is I, I often ask people about a time that they've changed their mind on an issue and why, because it's really hard to do, you know, so I'll give you two seconds to think about it. And people often really get flummoxed. And part of the reason for that is if you think about what changed your mind on an issue, it's often both these environmental factors that are what's going on behind it and a a couple of moments that will have been dawning. It will not have been someone coming and shouting at you and yelling at you or doing something something different. So like that, in terms of how people conduct themselves and what they're doing, I often ask them to think both about themselves and then how that might affect what they did. So I guess my, my final thing is a question for you actually, which is when did you change your mind on something and, and why? Well, now you've asked the question, I do remember being a very committed pacifist and then reading about a politician in Nicaragua, actually, who used violence in order to defend herself and others uh, as part of, of the, the revolution there. And on reading that, I realised that there were occasions where pacifism wasn't a useful response. But you're right about what you say about arriving at the conclusion through 
that kind of way because I remember having arguments with people about pacifism and becoming more entrenched in my pacifist beliefs during those arguments and it took reading the the autobiography of Nora Astorga before I actually shifted my position so yeah that's an interesting point that you've just put thank you thank you for asking the question that's right I think I might go and get hold of that book sounds excellent it, it really is worth read yeah definitely Ali, thank you so much. Diolch o fawr iawn. It's been lovely to speak to you. The time difference hasn't been a, an issue for us, thankfully. I wish you all the very best in, in your depolarization project. And I very much hope that people will have learned something from this conversation and will be able to apply that to their own political activism. Diolch o fawr iawn. My pleasure. I'd like to say diolch to those who have helped me with this project. Dear to the team at Audacity, the open source audio editing software used to make this podcast. Dear to Nick James for the artwork. Dear to Llewyn Stefan, the creator of the music. And finally, dear to all the podcast supporting subscribers. I'm grateful to all of you. I'm looking for support to continue to make these podcasts. You can become a supporting subscriber by checking out my Patreon page. You have been listening to the Leanne Wood Podcast. <laughs>